Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, in case you don't know, my name is Amanda Campbell. I'm the current president of Fairfax County SEPTA. I am also the parent of a sixth grader in a self-contained setting um, who uses an AAC device. And I am joined tonight as a co-moderator by Lauren McCaughey. I'll give her a second to open to introduce herself. Good evening, everyone. We're so glad you were able to join us. I am also uh, a parent in FCPS. I've got three different children, and two of them have IEPs, and one has a 504. All right. And we are very happy to welcome our FCPS guests this evening. We have Dr. Terry Edmonds Hurd, our um, assistant superintendent for the Department of Special Services. Uh, Mike Bloom, our director of special education instruction. Did I get that right, Mike? <laughs> and um, Don Schaefer, the director of due process and eligibility. And I'll give them all a moment to introduce themselves in just a second. I believe Tina is, Wilkerson is in the process of joining us as well. Let me just give a chance to pin all of the FCPS staff who are joining us. I'm um, so that everybody can see them, spotlight. There's Tina. Terry, can you go ahead and start to introduce yourself while I add the rest of the spotlights? Sure, I sure can. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here and thank you to SEPTA for inviting us to be here. Um, for your community event today. Um, my name is Terry Edmonds Hurd. I'm the interim assistant superintendent for the Department of Special Services, and I'm pleased to be here with many of my team members who are um, here too as well to share information about our department. So it's nice to be here. We hope we'll have a great um, evening together. Thank you so much. Mike, can you go ahead and introduce yourself as well? Sure, thank you, Amanda, and good evening, everyone. I'm Mike Bloom, and I'm the Director of Special Education Instruction with the Department of Special Services. So I work under the leadership of Dr. Edmonds Hurd, and I've been, this is my 23rd year, and uh, in the directorship, this is going on my fourth year. So it's nice to be here this evening. Thank you so much. And I'm not sure if I have a limit to spotlights. For Dawn, for some reason, it's not letting me spotlight you. That is A-OK. -okay. <laughs> <laughs> it has been a day of child emergencies at my house, so please pardon me for not having my camera on. We got home from the ER about an hour ago. Um, oh, goodness. I hope yes. everyone's okay. Well, yeah, everybody is fine. <laughs> um, I'm Dawn Schaefer. I'm the Director of Special Ed Procedural Support. Um, my office oversees uh, due process and eligibility, as well as all of the procedural support liaisons and uh, multi-agency services, which is formerly known as contract services. It's wonderful to be here with you all tonight. Thank you. And Tina, can you go ahead and introduce yourself as well? Hi, I'm Tina Walkerson. I'm the coordinator of Applied Behavior Analysis and Special Education Services. So I have, uh, I support, we support PAC. I had the ABA coaches. I, I support e in EAC, so Enhanced Autism and Cat B. And then additionally under me, I have Adaptive PE and ATS. Fantastic. And I see Denise Forrest has joined us, joined us as well. Denise, can you unmute? Yep, I can. Hi, I'm Denise Forrest. I'm coordinator for Early Childhood Special Education, which also includes the child find uh, component of identifying students. Thank you. And thank you all again for joining us tonight. We are very appreciative that you were able to reschedule, um, especially since it was pretty short notice. Um, so your flexibility is very much appreciated. We are going to jump. We don't have any business tonight since we took care of that in January. Um, for all of our SEPTA member pre members present, please know that we do have a general membership meeting on Tuesday, February 20th at 7 p.m. That will also be on Zoom. And we are bringing in um, Fairfax County Parks Authority to discuss um, summer camp opportunities, including adapted summer camp opportunities. Um, so please join, plan to join us for that. We will continue to have more business there. 
Um, but for tonight, we are just here for our community connections with DSS. And so we're going to go ahead and start. Um, I will just lead off with there are some questions that we have received. Some may be covered tonight. Some may be covered in a future event. Um, we'll go into a little bit more depth when we get to that subject later. Um, Lauren and I have gone through the questions and we've kind of um, put them all in little in categories to try and keep all questions within one category at a time rather than bouncing back and forth all over. Um, so let's get started. We're gonna have, we're gonna start just a little bit. Um, Terry, since you are so new to the position, I know you joined us in September, but if you could give a brief introduction to your background and your professional experience and like personal areas of interest, just to let our members get to know you a little bit, that would be great. I absolutely can do that. I could have done that earlier. I'm sorry about sorry. that. <laughs> um, <laughs> again, my name is Terry Edmonds Heard. Oh, my background. I started off in my uh, career. I've been in the field of education for many years now, 25 plus years. I started off as a special education teacher, and actually I kind of began my career here in Fairfax County Public Schools. But before that, I really started in Richmond City Public Schools. I went to school at VCU got a BS degree in special ed and went off and started teaching in a variety of places, including Richmond City Public Schools, Fairfax County Public Schools for about three years when I first started, got married and moved around to a variety of places where I taught um, special education resource classes with pull out and push in, as well as a contained class as well. I also did a short, short stint as a um, Title I reading teacher for a period of time too. I went back to school again and got my um, school administration degree. And from there I became an assistant principal and then a principal. Um, most of my um, administration, school administration years have been in North Carolina, which is where I moved here from. But I am in a Virginia. Most people forget that. I am originally from Virginia, born and bred down in South Boston, Virginia, a little small county near the North Carolina border. But um, after um, being in the schools in North Carolina, we moved, we located back here to Virginia and I was a principal at Franconia Elementary School. And then I moved into the executive principalship, which was in region four and in region five, and then um, moved into this position as the interim um, assistant superintendent for the department of special services. So with all of that said, I have lots of years <laughs> of experience. But I do learn every single day from my team. They share so much about the department and the different processes and things. It's very different being in the region and working and being over a department of four different teams. So I've got lots of learning, which I really enjoy doing. And I'm really enjoying this experience too, as well. Thank you. Um, and oh, thank and I'm you. sorry. I do have some interest. I'm sorry, Amanda. <laughs> no, you asked ahead. about interest too. I, do I did. Because we're all start humans off outside talking this about your. Too. <laughs> Talking about your children, I have two grown children, <laughs> um, age 31. My daughter is in Richmond, Virginia. She's a nurse practitioner and she travels around for her work. So she's been um, on the East Coast and the West Coast. I'm really happy that she's here on the East Coast in Richmond right now. And then my son um, works for Microsoft and he lives here in the area in Alexandria, Virginia. So my kids are kind of, of course, like everyone, they're pride and joy of um, having children and, and being with them and watching them to grow and develop. and Trust me, they do grow up at some point and you wish that they were back with you. So I know that things get busy for all of us and our children take many, many different paths in life. Um, but I know that everyone enjoys and very, very proud of their children and I am too as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I also wanted to say thank you to um, Terry opened up um, the opportunity for us to have some more frequent meetings with her as SEPTA. So currently we're meeting um, as SEPTA with DSS, with the DSS team every other month right now. And um, if you do want updates on that work, um, it has been difficult to do them in writing because of how much time that takes, but we do give um, verbal reports at our general membership meetings. So if you are interested in keeping track of that work and hearing updates about that, please make sure you attend those meetings. Um, what are some current initiatives or projects underway that we may or may not know about that you're finding really exciting? This could go to anybody. This, anybody can feel free to chime in. 
I, I would start off, if, I, if you don't mind, um, talking mm -hmm. about our preschool inclusion program that we've really been working intensely on. And I know that Denise is here. She can definitely add to that work. We really, as soon as I walked in, it was a project. Well, I won't even say it's a project. It was one of the big initiatives that we got um, heavily involved in. And so that would be some work that is definitely coming down the pike that we are continuing to work on is inclusion, especially for our youngest um, learners when they join us and making sure that they have opportunities with um, their uh, you know, general education peers too as well. So I'll turn it over for Denise for her to kind of just give a little update on what's going on with all the activity around that. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you, uh, Terry, for that introduction. Um, we uh, have begun working uh, beginning, I wanna say last May in um, developing a preschool plan for inclusion. We started this school year with making, uh, not making, requesting that the schools start to look at how they can provide inclusive opportunities for children. So at the sites where uh, early childhood special education is co-located with a pre-K program, um, the schools all decided uh, individual um, inclusion plans for individual schools based on the needs of the kids in the in the classrooms, both the pre-K kids and the special education kids. Um, and some examples of those inclusive opportunities at the, at the co-located sites are um, Messy Mondays. Um, I heard about uh, children that are going into the um, uh, into the gym on a regular basis to be instructed by the PE teacher with both the pre-K and the special education students. And that also included the preschool autism students. Um, I have, I've seen another plan uh, for another school where the kids are coming together for um, a library time with the librarian who is following the themes of the school year uh, of the units that are being taught. Um, and the pre-K kids and the special needs kids are coming together for that library time once a week. Um, so schools are doing anything from a one time a day activity or uh, multiple times a day activity to one time a week activity. It just depended on the schools and their um, the way that the teachers were able to arrange their schedule. Um, they were told this at, in early August, so they did not have a lot of planning time. Um, in order to get this, um, uh, the inclusive opportunities up and running. At the non-co-located sites, um, we have expanded our community peers model so that um, the classrooms that do not have the ability to integrate or to be included with the pre-K kids um, have invited community peers to come into the classroom. These are children that live in the community, um, and uh, are a part of that neighborhood school. Um, and they come in, um, most are coming in five days a week and being a full student body member in the classroom. Um, sometimes the schools are deciding to do to invite the community peers in four days a week so that one day they can do intensive de data collection and instruction with their special needs students. Um, and that is happening in, um, in some of the... Um, uh, early childhood class-based classrooms, um, and oftentimes when we have those community peers and a PAC program at the same school site, we are offering and inviting the PAC students to join us for a part of the day uh, to have access to those peer models. Moving forward and being able to be mindful, thoughtful, and planful about in inclusion. We were using this school year, so this fall, I've been working in close partnership with the pre-K program to create an inclusion plan to put forward to Dr. Reed. And this will allow us to be more formalized about it. So um, uh, unlike this school year where we gave the teachers very little planning time, um, hopefully next school year, the teachers are going to have much more planning time so that they can be even more intentional and provide even more meaningful inclusion experiences. So uh, the current plan right now is that at every co-located site, there will be a, a uh, classroom that is fully included with the pre-K classroom. Uh, where the teachers will be co-teaching together. So there'll be two classrooms, two classroom spaces 
Um, and then we'll do flexible grouping between the two different classrooms. So some of the general ed students would come into my classroom with my special needs students. And then some of the special needs students would go into the, the pre-K classroom. Um, and, and that will depend on the activity that's at hand. So for example, we might have all of the kids coming together in one room for morning meeting and then breaking out into half and half classrooms so that um, uh, each of the teachers take kids, um, half of the kids into their own space for that work time, that play time that the kids do. And then we would come back together maybe for recess and then divide back out again for um, for another activity, maybe circle time in a, in a moderate size group versus the large group activities. So that's what we're planning at the co-located sites. We are continuing to plan for the community peers and enhancing that even more next school year. Um, the schools found it very difficult to find community peers this fall uh, to recruit and find because most childcare uh, situations have already been established by August. And so I made the announcement today at my team lead meeting that now is a good time to start that advertising and recruiting as January, February is a typical time that parents start to seek out childcare for next August. So hopefully those uh, non-co-located sites will be able to get the community peers recruited and selected for next school year by the end of the spring and be ready to go to have community peers in their classroom on their first day. So that's the inclusion plan moving forward. Um, it still uh, needs approval by a lot of higher uppers, as I like to call them. Um, and so uh, the uh, director of the pre-K program, Tina Wilkerson and I are all waiting on the final approval before we can share um, the plans with the school-based administrators the, and the teachers. Um, everybody knows that um, this is coming. They just don't know exactly what it's going to look like yet. So we're waiting on that approval. Thank you so much for sharing that update, Denise. Um, I know that there have been, um, you know, some questions put forward about how PAC gets included in this program. Um, I know Ms. Sizemore Heiser from Braddock District has been putting those questions forward. And um, we certainly look forward to seeing what comes of it. We know that this was a very quick turnaround time. This came, this, this was born out of a group of preschool parents um, who were incredibly um, tenacious in their advocacy with the Advisory Committee for Students with Disabilities last year, and things moved very quickly from that. So for parents listening, small par groups of parent voices can be very powerful um, because this is very quick change, and we do appreciate that. Um, if there is anything that we can do um, in support of you know, helping to, you know, finalize and and work through some of the the questions about how do we do this for various groups and, you know, making sure it's implemented consistently across, like, please let us know. We're always happy to collaborate with FCPS. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Students. Yep. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. And, and I will share that this has been a, um, a lot of hard work, um, a lot of brain power thought to go into it. Uh, but it's been something that I've been working for since I started in this position. So I'm pleased that this is happening for all of us. Thank you. Um, and just a note to everybody who is here, if you do have questions that come up as you are um, listening to the comments tonight, um, please send them to Lauren McCaughey. It's very difficult for me to follow the chat and facilitate the questions. So please send them to Lauren. She will update the document that we are working from. Um, and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, and also for our presenters, please keep that in mind because we do have a lot of questions and we're trying, I will, we will do our best to get through as many of them as we can because there is a wide variety of topics that our members want to cover. Um, keeping that in mind, um, a quick follow up, Dr. Edmonds heard. SEPT has been cl working closely with you um, to ensure students with mobility impairments can evacuate the building with their non-disabled peers. Um, I know that you gave an update, a brief update to ACSD last month. Can you give that update to our members so that they know where we are in that process? Yes, I surely can. So we met, gosh, Lee, the, the months just seem to be flying by, but we met uh, probably several months ago now um, with one of the fire um, chiefs um, for the Department of Fairfax. 
And so when we met with them, we discussed of some of what the issues were that we were facing in terms of being able to evacuate students out of the, the building in a safe manner, concerns about the FISA room, which is the room that's called where students with disabilities are sometimes moved to to be evacuated, the lack of actual practice and drills for that room on a monthly basis because schools are required to have um, drills done on a monthly basis. And we were sharing with him that we don't feel that drills are actually done with that. So when we left that meeting, um, Mr. Tom Vaccarello was there, um, Ms. Campbell was there, Dr. Reed was there. Um, we had someone from facilities was there as well. So we met a couple times after that. And Mr. Vaccarello, who is with safety and security, which this kind of falls into his department and my department would be supporting it because we're talking about our students with disabilities. He was drafting up a plan to share with Dr. Reed. I checked in with him a couple of weeks ago, probably about two weeks now, and I can return to kind of check to see what the status of that plan is. But the plan was to include um, the provision of chairs or um, devices that can be used to help children be um, removed from the building if there is a fire or there is a, a reason to be evacuated. We were looking at the cost for all of that. We talked about it being done in um, prioritizing schools because of course the money that would be involved in um, purchasing all of those devices was a concern, but we wanted to make sure that we could get started on a plan and determine how we could do it in a layered sort of a process. So when I checked in with Mr. Vaccarello, like I said, he was working on that plan and getting that to Dr. Reed. And I can check back in our next meeting. Yeah, it is. Yes, it is. Oh. Yeah, it Hold is on just a moment, please. Sorry about that. Thank you, no problem. <laughs> um, so I can circle back to him to see where we are with submitting that plan to Dr. Reed. I haven't seen any other meetings to pop up for me to attend on that, so I assume he's still working on that that um, plan and getting that into Dr. Reed, but I will check on that. Thank you, and thank you for the update and the work on that. It is an important work that a SEPTA member brought to our attention um, mm -hmm. a little more than a year ago. So this has been in progress for a bit, and we're happy to hear the progress that's being made. Um, jumping into questions that have been submitted, um, we have a question on teacher retention. Um, and I, as best as I can, I'm going to read them as is. Some of them are a little long, so they may get slightly reworded, but it's the idea of the question is still there, the main idea. While we understand that you don't have control over the budget, if the extended workday contract is not part of the proposed budget, FCPS will likely lose a large number of special education teachers. The workload is increasing and forcing every currently contracted special ed teacher to take a pay cut, and it's insulting. We are aware of the recruitment efforts that are happening to attempt to hire new teachers. Please update us on what your office has done so far, working in collaboration with the school board and board of supervisors to retain current special education teachers. Well, I'll, I'll take a stab at that one. Um, our, our office, in terms of retaining teachers, we have quite a bit of professional development that is offered to support our teachers. We also have our department chairs who have been in place for a while now um, that we work through to disseminate information and provide support um, to our teachers. When we're in meetings such as stack, we make sure that our uh, that our folks who attend to those meetings know what types of supports that we can provide our schools. For the last um, several months, since probably around October, we have been doing a principal briefing. And in that briefing, we do talk about uh, ways that our principals can also support teachers, particularly with making sure that they're checking in with them, that they're checking in with them in terms of their planning time, because that can be a big issue with our teachers sometime, taking them off of duties if they're able to, of course, supervising children, is the main responsibility for everybody, but just looking at little ways that they can support teachers and help help them to you know, acclimate well if they are new teachers. We also have a teacher mentor support program that we have put in place for our teacher trainees. We have done the same. We have a, a mentoring program in place for them too as well. So I would say that one of the main things we do is try to support our principals who in turn, we encourage them to support um, their teachers in the classroom. 
um, and that they provide information um, to providing information to them. We're hoping that the tips and things that we give in our briefing will help to support. I have not heard and had an update. We it has been asked frequently, even at Stack on last Thursday. The question came up about the contract. I know that the budget is being presented this week, so hopefully we will have some information on that too as well. Aside from continuing the extended day contract, are there any other, um, you know, finance, for example, financial ways that uh, the DSS has advocated for retaining special education staff? Incentives or, you know, incentives discussed or anything like that? We, we are always, we meet, as a matter of fact, I met with the Human Resources Department today as well. We are always um, trying to figure out ways that we can, and, and that's more so people that we're getting signing on, because right now we're headed into the hiring season. So we've more so talked about being able to offer incentive, incentives and bonuses and things to attract people. As you know, we're uh, surrounded by quite a few counties, and we sometimes compete over the same candidates. So I know that it has been brought up in that arena. I haven't heard of any updates on that. Um, but as for financial things that we we more so concentrate on what we can do to support our teachers in the classroom in terms of trainings, professional development, in terms of helping our principals to help, like if they're having a struggle with a teacher or they need support to please reach out to our office. Our you know folks that we have on our team stay really, really busy in school, supporting them in a variety of ways. So we try to provide in that way as well. And okay. I'll also mention yep. that uh, one of the things I was going to mention earlier about exciting things that are happening, there's a lot of work that's taking place around the enhancement plan for students with disabilities. And while we won't be able to go into all of the details, just know that there are a number of actions related to teacher recruitment and retention. And some of those include some of the very things that Dr. Edmonds heard had mentioned, like uh retention bonuses for teachers, the extended day contract, and all of these things are areas that the implementation teams early on recognized and identified as areas that we felt as a team um, could move the mark in terms of keeping and reaching teachers to come to Fairfax County. Um, just a couple other quick things. We do have a Grow Your Own program here in Fairfax County. And we have a number of cohorts with James Madison University and George Mason University that provide some tuition assistance to educators who are looking to complete their endorsement uh, licensure programs in special education. And so we have a number of, uh, of cohorts that are running early childhood adapted curriculum and general curriculum cohorts. Um, and then as, as Dr. Edmonds heard mentioned, we also um, are providing some additional professional development to our teacher trainees and our novice teachers. Uh, some of that occurs naturally through the Great Beginnings program, where we have a number of cohorts for our new novice teachers that meet monthly. But just uh, starting a couple of weeks ago um, and continuing through the end of the year, we're pulling together all of the teacher trainees one day a month for some additional professional development because we want to be able to retain them. And as many of them are moving into cohort programs, we want to, again, make sure that we're supporting them as they seek licensure in special education. Thank you, Mike. That actually ties into another question we received that got put in a different category, so I'm going to put it here. Um, my child is in the classroom with a provisionally licensed teacher. I'm concerned about their inexperience. Can you explain more about how these teacher, these teachers, the provisionally licensed ones, are being supervised and mentored? Sure. So the the supervision for any teacher really happens at the school level. So that building principal and those building administrators are the primary supervisor of that employee in their school building, whether they're a teacher trainee or a provisionally licensed teacher. You know, provisionally licensed teachers, uh, they do have that introductory course in special education completed, and they're working toward, under a timeline, their complete uh, licensure program to be a certified and licensed special educator. Um, so for our provisionally licensed teachers, again, we have a number of central office supports uh, that we can provide to those teachers. Um, 
Some of the supports, as I mentioned, are the Great Beginnings cohorts that meet monthly. Um, we also have support via a team of five uh, special education mentor coaches. And so again, they're prioritizing throughout the county. There are only five of them, but they do prioritize their support to our novice teachers, our new teachers, uh, provisionally licensed teachers. Um, and then any of our central office supports, um, instructional, behavioral, our ABA coaches, behavior intervention teachers, our curriculum support team members. We do have a list from Human Resources of where our teacher trainees, long-term substitutes, and provisionally licensed teachers are. And so we send that information out to our different programs within our office so that all of the support staff can prioritize, check in, making sure that those novice or younger teachers, um, when I say younger, I mean experience-wise, uh, are receiving the supports that they need. Um, so again, we're trying the best we can to provide that support. We're realizing that our, our novice teachers, they're along this continuum of experience and, and skill when it comes to instruction, behavior. And so we're really trying to meet them where they are, prioritize the needs and uh, think of additional ways that we can support like the additional professional developments that we've provided. Um, Don, this might be best for you to answer. Is it my, it, my understanding is that a provisionally licensed teacher is not just supervised by the admin on the ground, but that they also have somebody supervising their case manager work, like the paperwork side of things. Um, is that correct? Uh, teacher trainees um, cannot case manage, but provisionally licensed teachers can. Okay. Thank yep. you for clarifying on that. All right. Um, our next is go kind of flipping backwards to the budget again, because um, that was kind of a budget question. Um, is there anything else? in the budget that we as parents, it would that it would be helpful for us to know about that's important to special education, you know, that we should know about as this budget process goes forward, where we can help provide support in advocating. Um, aside from the extended day contracts, is there any other issue that we should be aware of? Nothing. Well, I think once we see the budget, we might have a better idea of where folks can can advocate. I will say just from listening in to or being in our FAESP um, meeting, staffing is always a concern, having adequate staffing to you know meet the needs of all of our schools, um, and not just in the classroom, um, which is the major area. But also just, you know, if Mike Axler would hear, was here, he would talk with you about the need for psychologists and social workers and people to support, you know, the social emotional learning of our students too, uh, counselors as well. We can't say enough about the need there to support our students. So I would say anything that you could do to promote that, it's always important. And our schools are always talking about just the need. They want to be able to support students as much as they can. And many times they will advocate for um, staffing in different different types of areas in our different classrooms. I don't know if our team has anything to add, add to that as well. Well, I agree with Dr. Edmonds heard that I think after we see what Dr. Reed's budget will include, we'll have a better idea as we move forward in prioritizing some of the funding that was allocated from the school board toward some of the actions in the enhancement plan for students with disabilities. And so we do have some funding uh, that was originally um, given to uh, us for consideration as we work through uh, and develop a lot of those actions. But again, I think this week, later this week, we'll have a better idea of how we can most effectively and efficiently allocate some of those funds that we've already received versus what are some additional funds. I can tell you, we didn't receive $22 million for the extended day contract for special education teachers. So that's not something that the school board has already um, considered. But again, some of those personnel items that include compensation, like bonuses, retention, hiring, um, the extended day contract, those, those budgetary items are pretty significant and that's where I think the budget process is going to bear out um, what ultimately happens there. 
Thank you. Um, I do want to follow up, um, Terry, when you were answering the retention question, you mentioned um, uh, teacher prep periods and lunch um, uh, plant lunch times. Um, I do just want to highlight for our members, there is a bill in the House right now regarding that specific issue. This is an issue um, if you're not in that environment that does it especially impact our multi-grade level classrooms. Um, for example, we've got classes, classrooms in the county that are K through six. So what happens because those teachers often, teachers in gen ed often have their planning time during a special or, you know, and then they have lunch during their grade level lunch, but because these teachers are hosting multiple grade levels at the same time, they end up having students in their classroom for academics all, you know, at every point throughout the day. So there is a house bill uh, to draw your attention to, it's House Bill 583 from Shelley Simons. Um, I, that was in subcommittee earlier this week, and I do believe it reported out from that, so that if you are interested in doing any kind of communication with your legislators at the state level, that is something that you can reach out to them on um, if you choose to support it. So I just wanted to let our members know that. Following up, all right, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna dive into OCR, <laughs> um, the compensatory services reimbursements. Um, I am gonna ask that we keep our answers short because there are a lot of as short as possible. I know it's complicated. Um, there are a lot of questions and we're certainly happy to follow up more in email and follow up with a post later for our members if it's too complicated to address here. Um, but we do have quite a few questions on this. So we're gonna jump right in. Um, first, just if we could get in a brief overall update on the process, how many staff are working on this? Is there an expected full date of completion? And who are the who are currently the best contacts for parents who want to know who, you know where in the process their reimbursements are? Thanks for that, Amanda. We um, we have a lot of folks working on this part time. Um, believe it or not, we have uh, one person who's allocated full time for this at this time, um, and that's one of our finance management technicians, um, and. Otherwise, we have probably, I don't know, Terry, you might have the numbers right in front of you, but it's probably 30 people working part time um, on this. Um, we do hope that the new OCR plan administrator can start soon. Um, that person has been selected and is still in the process of being hired. Um and so that would give us some additional assistance. And we're also looking at some other ways to creatively um, use some funding that was allocated that um, we can hire a couple other folks to assist. Um, in terms of completion, um, we completed 50% of reimbursements as of Friday, um, this past Friday, and we are working diligently um, to complete the rest of them as soon as possible. Um, we have been meeting with uh, the comptroller and with finance um, staff um, to look at our processes, um, our financial processes to ensure that they are as smooth as possible. Um, and so just this week, um, there was a meeting today um, in fact, with our staff um, supporting this to talk about the way that those processes are, sm are smoothing out. Um, and so we, we're we hoping that things will pick up even more um, as as we added, add more staff and have smoothed out the processes some. And I don't know, Terry, if you wanna jump in too. Um, I think you've covered most of it, Dawn. The only thing I'll add is that we did send a uh, communication out to families who have not received their reimbursement yet, um, just uh, letting them know we are still working on it. We are committed to getting all of these reimbursements done, that we've committed quite a bit of staff to it as well, um, and that we uh, are working really hard on that and letting them know you know, what they can do to help us too as well in terms of just documentation if the school team reaches out, you know, to communicate with them too as well. So that letter went home on yesterday to those families who are still waiting a reimbursement. Thank you. All right. Um, 
can you also share, um, I believe in previous meetings, you have told us the people to reach out to are you, uh, Don Schaefer and Leona Smith. Are those still the three appropriate contacts? Yes, we will keep it that way. And once the plan administrator is online, then we will send communication maybe through you, Amanda. I don't know if there's a way for you to make sure that you share it. We will make sure that yep. we put it online too as well. We will share it with our principal groups. We'll share it with everybody so they know who the new plan administrator is. We're giving them some time. We have a transition plan for them, for that person that's coming in. And so that will streamline it. But for in the meanwhile, just email all three of us and that way we all will receive and our plan is to, to communicate with um, folks who reach out to us. Thank you. If somebody could put those email addresses in the chat, um, that would be really helpful. I'll read them aloud once they're there for the reporting no purposes. Thank you, um, Don. I'll take care of it. Thank you. Instead of individually emailing, so this kind of goes on that process, instead of individually emailing staff who have limited time, could there be an online dashboard where families could put in their student ID number to get an update? Is there a way that it could be integrated perhaps into parent view or even a separate website with the dashboard? I'll let Dawn take that one. I'm not sure if they've ever um, discussed having a dashboard um, for this. I feel like it was floated out there at some point. Um, so I'll let Dawn see if she can help with an sure. answer to that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you. Um, I think that uh, it's it's difficult to, to conceptualize a dashboard um, in that there are, are currently uh, multiple layers of, of review um, for the, uh, for reimbursements. And so um, I can, I can take that back to our folks and see what they can come up with. I know we do have some software that might be able to, to help do that. I just, I am, I'll admit I'm not techie enough to, um, to say, yeah, that sounds great. Um, <laughs> so we <laughs> can certainly take that back and, and ask like, can it, would it be possible to use this concept for this purpose? If it is possible, it sounds like it might lessen a lot of the workload on the staff who are working on it part time if families can just check on it whenever they need to. Um, and it could also help on the administration set the, the school administrator side of things who when they're when families are having a hard time getting updates, um, because we know that you guys are all doing, a you know, wearing a lot of hats at the same time, then they go to their school principals asking for further updates from them. But the principals don't know either. Um, so it could help all around with anxiety and workload. Thank you for Thank that, you. Amanda. I will I will add to that in one of our briefings, and we can revisit that again. Our principals express concerns about not knowing too as well. So we set up the process that if parents reach out, the information is funneled to the department chair, and then the department chair can reach out to the PSL, and the PSLs are in touch with us in terms of those things too as well. So if that helps a little bit, we did try to put that process in place. I do remember quite a while back, we did get um, Dr. Sethi involved too as well. So we could follow up on that just to see if that is any type of opportunity there for that. Sounds good. Thank you so much. And I do have the email addresses from Dawn. I'm going to read them aloud for the sake of the recording um, because they can be difficult to find on the site. Um, the first one is Dawn Schaefer. We have Dawn, D-A-W-N dot Schaefer, S-C-H-A-E-F as in Frank, E-R at fcps.edu. Then we have Leona Smith, L, M as in Mary, Smith at fcps.edu. And then we have TL Edmonds, H-E-A, at fcps.edu. Um, so I'll put all of these in the chat to everyone as well, um, because it is just host and panelists for tonight. So here you go. Um, those are the email addresses to reach out to for your specific updates right now, everyone. Amanda, um, you might want to read Leona's again. She has a number three. Oh, in yep. Her L, thank you. Leona Smith is LM Smith 3 at fcps.edu. Thank you, Don, for correcting me on that. All right, next question on OCR. Um, I've been trying to get compensatory reimbursement since July. Once I get paid for July through December invoices, I'm concerned about January, which I just submitted. 
there needs to be some expectation that invoices will be paid within 30 or 60 days. It's too much to ask parents to carry balances of thousands of dollars for indefinite time periods. Is there anything that can be done to make this faster? Thank you for that. And we agree with you. Um, 100%. Um, last week, I reassigned um, one of our staff who's been working part time on this to start working on um, on the future, what we call future reimbursements for services um, where families have decided to use a private provider for services that were allocated. Um, and she is processing those. Um, I think I know who may have submitted that um, question um, because we're we in are. touch regularly, um, but um, we are working on it. Um, and please feel free to call or email me um, for a very specific update for your child. Thank you. Um, I do not know who it was. It's all anonymous on our end. So <laughs> um, this goes, I, I, you covered this, I think, a little bit just now, Terry, but we did receive this question um, for administrators. So it might not be as clear for administrators. If you could maybe expand on it a little, see, is there a way for administrators to be informed where in the process OCR is with reimbursement or when reimbursement to families is complete? Admin continually field questions from parents and work to support families who aren't familiar with the OCR process. Having a clear idea of where families are can allow for admin to support families with this process. I think one of the easiest ways is for our administrators, all of our schools have a PSL that's assigned for them to touch base with the PSL. And then the PSL has a contact with our office that they can easily ask those questions to in terms of where things are in the process. Okay. And we can so reiterate just... that at our upcoming briefing too as well to remind principal, because it was a while back when we discussed that. So we can do okay. that in our upcoming briefing, remind them of what they can do if they want to find out that information. Yeah, it might be helpful to just share periodically. Um, I'm sure like you all, I will think of something and remember it for about two weeks and then it might be gone for a little while and then I might remember it again. Um, so it's always helpful to have reminders. Um, several families awaiting reimbursement related to COVID services are military or DOD affiliated, causing them to move out of state before payment can be rendered. Updates have been promised but not received from DDS. How can, I think that might be DSS, um, how can payments be tracked for all who are owed and who will be responsible to families who have left FCPS without having the compensation? We, um, we will mail, actually not we, the Fairfax County government is who, who cuts the checks and mails them. They'll mail them to the address that is on the W-9 that was submitted by the parent. Um, and so right. if that's the... And if, if you move, let us know, um, and we can, um, we probably would need an updated W-9 so that they can associate you with a new address on the back end. Um, and I'll put the email address for submitting W-9s um, in the chat. Amanda, if you want to read that, or put yes. that out for everybody in just a minute. Um, yep. That way you're not needing, folks aren't needing to send those um, to staff members. That would be great. Um, Cause I was just going to say the address on the W9 is likely the address they had when they lived here. And at the time they, they wouldn't have had their moving address at that point. So um, thank you. That will, I will share that when that comes through. Um, I am not a U.S. citizen, so I do not have a W-9. What do I need to do to continue the process? We will accept a W-8 um, rather than a W-9. Um, and that works just fine. And you can send it to the same email address um, that I just put in the chat to Amanda that she's going to read for you. That email address is submit, S-U-B as in boy, M-I-T, C-1-9-W-9 at fcps.edu. Copy that and put that in the chat for everyone. Um, can that, I know that there are uh, compensatory service FAQs on the website. 
Is there something on there about the W-8 being an option for those who need it? And if not, can that be added? Absolutely. Let me make a note right now to double check that. Thank you. And then our last question on recovery services for the night. Um, where is the policy that states, quote, COVID rec recovery compensatory, CRC, can only be signed off once you have completed an IEP? In September, we agreed to uh, co COVID rec bleh, CRC, but have been told that since goals need to be updated, we cannot have it signed until we have been through the IEP. We have been asked in not too many words to accept goals we don't agree with so we can get the IEP signed which I don't want to do is this is a legal document. Um, is this, should this not be something that families can sign in partial consent where they agree to compensatory service services, but do not agree with the goals and then compensatory services can be instituted from there? Absolutely. Um, you can always agree in partial consent, but it sounds uh, or provide partial consent, it sounds like in that particular situation, they may not have completed the proposal, like the full proposal. So there's nothing for the parent to quite consent to yet, especially if it's a, I'm it not sure. It says that they agreed to the compensatory hours. Yeah. So um, it sounds like that part was completed, but, but have been told that since the goals aren't, it can't be processed yet. Right. And that's why I said, I, I wonder if it, there's not a complete proposal, like a whole IEP being proposed yet. Um, parent, if you're um, if you're attending tonight and have submitted that question, um, I would suggest you first contact your procedural support liaison. Um, and if you're not sure who that is, um, we will put a, a link so that you can find out who that is in the chat and Amanda can or um Amanda or Lauren can make that uh, public for everyone. Um, and then if you're not um, if you're not happy with what you you hear or you continue to have questions, um, you can certainly call uh, due process and eligibility uh, with your specific questions. Um, and uh, their phone number, I will also put in the chat for you. Um, I don't want to talk about your specific situation without some more information. All right. Thank you, Don. Um, we did have an additional question come in from the chat. Uh, thank you for submitting the questions through there. Given cybersecurity concerns, why is FCPS asking parents to email W-9 forms with social security numbers rather than submit them through a secure portal? That's a wonderful question. And, and we have had that conversation ourselves. Um, we don't yet have a secure portal. Um, if you're uncomfortable submitting a W-9 through email, and we completely understand that, you are welcome to snail mail or um, hand deliver your W-9. Um, and uh, I can also put the address um, of our office, or you can hand deliver it to your neighborhood school um, and let your special ed department chair know that you're doing so, and they'll make sure we get it. Um, we can come by and get it or we'll figure out how to get it. Um, you don't have to, to email it to us. Thanks for that. Okay, thank you. And that's going to be another one where I'm going to say if we can update the website that mentions all of this and has that email address, if we can make those updates there. Might lessen some emails back and forth from people. No problem. Thank you. All right, um, moving on. I do not see any current more questions. Oh, I did just get another question about W-9s. How are the W-9s stored and maintained? That's a great question. Um, access to W-9s is very limited. Um, there is one individual in FCPS who processes W-9s and um, obtains vendor numbers um, through the Fairfax County government. Once that process is complete, W-9s are destroyed. Um, so we do not maintain them. Okay. You don't maintain, so does an electronic copy remain or? No, no. those okay. are deleted as well. Okay, thank you. 
I will continue to monitor. Again, I do ask, please try to send it to Lauren if you can. I'm trying to follow the chats that are coming through to me, but I may be more likely to miss it. So please send to Lauren if you can. Um, we understand that efforts are underway to incorporate language translation directly into CSTARS. Can you give an update on that process, a brief one? Sure thing. Um, I love the prompt that it needs to be brief. Um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a lot, um, and we're already an hour in. No, it's fine. <laughs> uh, that work is underway. Um, we have been working with um, the vendor um, for the language transition translation, as well as the vendor for C Stars, um, and we're we're sort of the middle person um, in between um, as a client of both. And so, um, our hope is that that will be up and live and running well um, no later than fall. Fantastic. That's great to yes. hear. Um, that has been long, long in coming, um, recommended by ACSD for many years. Uh, we've been working towards that as well. So it will be great to see that um, come into fruition. Next question coming up. How is the county helping gen ed and special education teachers gain skills to successfully expand inclusion practices in the classrooms? We talked about it a little for pre-K, but more for K through 12. So again, I wanted to uh, point to a couple of different things. One is some existing training that we've had ongoing in the county for a number of years. So for example, for a number of years, we've had very specific training around co-teaching as one example. Um, another area that we're continuing to expand our training throughout the county is around accessibility tools. So our assistive technology services team is really providing professional development that will equip general education teachers to be able to help students access technology so that they can move into a less restrictive environment. So a lot of the things that we're focusing on are accessibility, access to content, access to the curriculum through accommodations, through special education supports, um, and then of course, through professional development that we're providing. So those are some of the things that we've had ongoing for, for a number of years. Um, the enhancement plan does also specify different things that will support inclusion. Um, one of the big areas of focus that we're gonna be working on is really rolling out a couple of big, big frameworks in the county. Um, we're doing a lot of work around high leverage practices, for example, and these are practices that are essential skills that all teachers need to have in order to be able to support um, diverse student populations and really all students in the general education setting and in special education settings. And then we've also started, uh, in fact, today I attended a central office training and tomorrow on universal design for learning. And so again, we're gonna be rolling out on April 2nd, countywide for our instructional staff throughout the county, some uh, introductory training into universal design for learning. And so universal design really helps teachers to proactively look at their instruction, look at the diverse learners within their classrooms, and then design the curriculum and the instruction in a way that minimizes the barriers that keep students from accessing that curriculum. And so again, without going into a lot of the principles of universal design for learning. That's another area that we're really going to focus on. Thank you, Mike. A follow up question to that. Um, when you talk about it, you know, the teachers attending this, well, does this include not just general education teachers, but for example, our specialists, our elective teachers, or music teachers, art, PE? Um, does that UDL training include them as well? Yes, I believe the April 2nd training is going to include all instructional staff and educators. Okay, thank you. Because as a former music educator, I can say that hearing instructional staff, it didn't necessarily always include us. So um, I appreciate that clarification. Um, I did see a fantastic comment, and I know we spoke about it briefly 
yesterday um, from a music teacher at the um, school board meeting on uh, January 25th, um, talking about how she gets as a music therapist, she gets lots of emails coming in from music teachers in a, in a, a typical uh, music education setting, asking for how do I help include students with disabilities in my classroom? I really want to, I don't know how, because we like many others don't actually get that training in our teacher prep programs. Um, so I appreciate that. And I'm going to take a moment to let's celebrate um, Annie Ray at Annandale High School, who won the Grammy this weekend um, for educator of the music educator of the year, which is fantastic, um, specifically for her work with students with disabilities and um, having them being able to access performing arts with an orchestra program, which I think is utterly fantastic. And we are talking about how ways that we can hopefully recognize her later this year with our own award ceremony. Um, and I know we've talked about it a lot, but there's fantastic things happening all across the county in individual little pockets. And the question becomes, how do we take those fantastic things and help them occur across the county so you don't have to be in a specific school or a specific pyramid to have access? So we will continue our conversations on that, <laughs> I'm sure. Well, and that's that's one of the things that was highlighted um, in the enhancement plan. Actually, the... Uh, American Institutes for Research in their report to the school board really pointed out the need for greater consistency across all schools in Fairfax County. So as we're developing a lot of our actions related to the enhancement plan, um, we are keeping that in mind that we need to be able to roll things out and make sure that they're done with fidelity across schools consistently. A uh, question that came in on this as a follow-up, what about the barriers that teachers have to doing hands-on learning that allow for more accessible learning? For example, um, teachers indicating that a, a child might not be able to participate because the teachers have to move so fast to barrel through the curriculum and meet the curriculum needs, um, and they have a difficult time slowing down. So how does that get addressed when we're talking about universal design for learning and implementing that alongside the pressures of meeting the SOL curriculum needs? Sure. So that's a great question. And I'm certainly no expert in universal design for learning, but I think that's part of us embarking as a county in the universal design for learning framework. So April 2nd is going to be the starting place and there's going to be follow-up professional development through next school year as well, building on this initial training. And so I think there's going to be a lot more to come where teachers are going to be asking questions about how does universal design for learning fit in with all of the other demands around uh, the curriculum and teaching to the SOLs and the SOL testing and um, all of the other things that we have happening in the, in the county. So universal design will be will be one component that we're going to learn more about. And uh, I know that the, the barriers are part of the framework and how teachers can help to eliminate those barriers. And I think this is going to provide some for some rich discussion coming up um, on how we will be able to do that successfully. So I don't have the answer now, but uh, it's all going to be unfolding as the training starts. Work in progress always. Um... Somebody asked a follow up to Denise, your um, your introduction about the pre, uh, preschool inclusion uh, initiative. I'm interested in knowing how I can find the schools that are implementing the inclusive preschools and flexible grouping. How would they go about doing that? So right now, those schools have not been released yet. We're waiting for the final approvals and then we will meet with the school administrators and let them know specifically what type of inclusive experience they will be offering at their school. Um, so hold tight. That's still information that's yet to be released. Uh, my hope, my fingers crossed hope, is that it'll be released by the end of February at the latest, um, as we know that building principals are getting ready to hire and they need to hire the right type of teacher for the right type of program. So um Fingers crossed that will be coming out soon. Thank you, Denise. And as always, we're happy to help share that information out. So feel free to send that information my way and we'll find a way to share it with the community as well. We know that there's a lot of families who, who are interested in this movement and we'll do whatever we can to help keep them informed. Um, 
Also, just as a quick, Mike, um, you indicated that there was yesterday in our meeting that there's going to be an e-notify that goes out soon about ESY information. Yes, we have recently posted the school sites for our ESY summer program on our website. And so if you're interested now, you can go to the FCPS search box and just uh, type in ESY and you'll get to that site that has that information. But we will be sending out a, an e-notify um, with the direct link to the website and some additional information. But yes, we're very excited. The hiring process has begun. Administrators have been hired already. And now in February, we're moving forward with our teacher and our paraprofessional and support staff hires. Uh, the good news is we have funding this year for the enhanced or increased uh, hourly rates that we've provided uh, last year, same hourly rates. And so we anticipate that we're going to get some good response in the upcoming weeks to our uh, application process. Thank you. All right, we are going to power through. We've still got a lot coming in. Um, another one that has come in tonight um, relates to speech services, and this will not be unfamiliar to most of you on the call from DSS because you've heard many of these questions and concerns from me over the years. Um, it's about the uh, language that is often shared in preschool IEP meetings regarding speech services direct speech services not being required due to the fact that preschool is a quote, language rich environment. Um, the question is about how does FCPS define language rich environment um, and how does classroom instruction with non SLP certified instructors substitute for actual SLP services? Um, and is it the position of FCPS that any preschool special education teacher or IA is trained to provide SLP services? So no, uh, no early childhood special educator, unless they also have a speech and language pathology degree, uh, should be passing themselves off as a speech and language pathologist. Uh, we have asked that the staff take out the wording language rich environment from their vocabulary, because any environment that a child is in should be a language rich environment. Um, we have taken it down from the websites. We've taken it down from anything that we have uh, shared out in the past. What we do believe is that preschool special education teachers are developmental experts, and they do have expertise in both atypical and typical development as a part of their training. And in fact, they do have the ability to teach children communication. When we get to the more disordered speech we do not have that ability. So using our expertise, we are able to elicit and provide explicit instruction um, and, and design instruction in ways that help children learn to communicate. Once we get past the point where we don't have um, the knowledge base in which to provide speech services or communicate, let me rephrase that, to provide communication development because of disordered speech, that's when a speech and language pathologist will be definitely referred to and, um, and, and consulted with. So if a parent, um, as I said, I've experienced this myself. So if a parent is experiencing difficulties with their child receiving speech services and they believe that you know, their understanding from their private providers, from, you know, outside data that they may have separate from the school district is that their their child does have disordered speech to the extent that they require an SLP in order to address that, but they're having difficulties get, getting those services in the IEP meeting. Who should they reach out to to have that conversation further if they're not getting anywhere in their IEP? So I would, I would, um, ask that they reach out to the school-based speech and language pathologist. Um, you know, the, the preschool special education teachers are not the ones that are making the final decision as to speech and language services because we don't have that expertise. We don't know how to diagnose a speech disorder. So therefore, we're going to probably take a background seat in that IEP meeting and listen to what the speech and language pathologist has to say. And then we would weigh in with our also um, uh, with our information about how that 
um, disorder might be impacting the child within that educational environment. Um, and so we'll listen to what the speech and language pathologist has to say about the disorder first, and then we can support and or defend the speech and language pathologist with data that we have collected within the classroom, within the child's functioning within the classroom in a, a in that instructional environment. Thank so you. So reach out to the speech and language pathologist at your school. Thank you for the very clear course of action on what to do next. Um, it can be it can be a time consuming process. That's all I will say. Um, and I understand both from from both sides of the aisle, from staff and students. Like it it can go on, and it it's a difficult conversation to have. Um, but communication is imperative, and we all know that. I'm very happy to hear that the language rich environment language is is being changed. And so I, I can share with you that there are still veteran teachers. You know, I've been doing this for 31 years and I used language rich environment when I was teaching. Um, so there are still veteran teachers out there who are still using it, but we have reminded the teachers at every single team lead meeting for the last three years not to use it. So hopefully it'll catch on one day soon. Thank you so much for that update. Um, this is a quick follow up and this is not preschool. So does FCPS have speech services for speech in middle school, uh, for middle school kids? Um, and is there any kind of bar, like what is the bar for us to qualify for SLP services? Is there, we don't have anybody from related services here. Is there anybody here that can speak to that? I mean, we don't have uh, Barbara Fee. She's our manager of communication disorders um program in FCPS. She's not here, but we can certainly take some questions back to her. I mean, the the answer is yes, we have students in at all levels that are accessing speech and language services. And you know, the process is again very similar um, as you move from preschool, elementary, middle, and high school, uh, that it flows through the IEP and that you know speech and language um, evaluations and assessments are done. Uh, they can be done through reevaluation as well, and then the team will come back together and discuss um, needs uh, as identified through the evaluation process and all of the other available data there. And so, yes, if a if a if a student does require speech and language services um, at the middle and high school, they'll certainly receive that as part of their IEP. I can't speak to really a threshold. That would be something maybe we can uh, have a specific answer uh, if you send me a question on that. Yeah, we have another very specific question about a specific um, communication disorder. So I'll include that in something that I sent to you as well, um, because I think that is an, a question more appropriate for um, speech service, you know, our communication disorders department, which is not here. Um, for those who are additionally interested, ACSD did have the managers from, did have various managers from related services at one of its fall meetings this year. Um, I believe Ellen Ferguson was there representing the communication disorders department. The videos for these meetings are online on YouTube. Um, I can't remember exactly what month it was, but you can take a look at the agenda to see um, if it is listed on the agenda. And there is some discussion there that might also help answer some questions if you're interested in, in further specific related services questions. What progress has FCPS made in having schools follow the updated guidance for alternatives to the cafeteria for students who would benefit from a calm, predictable space? So I can share a little bit of information. Um, you know, the beginning of this year, we did have some opportunities internally to create a resource document. We actually started this work the, uh, the uh, second half of last school year. And uh, we created a, a document. Um, it's a, a guidance document for creating trauma-informed spaces in schools. And it really is a document that's inclusive of a couple of different spaces. So as schools were seeking to create different areas within their school building that could be considered um, a safe area or a welcoming area, um, that was one sort of category of spaces. And then the other spaces that schools had interest in learning more about were self-regulation spaces. So this might be a space within a classroom or a different part of the schoolroom 
Um, some might call them a, a Zen room or a calming room, um, but it's really a different purpose. It's really meant for students to be able to uh, take a short break to sort of ground themselves, refocus, and then get back and join the instructional program um, as part of their day. Specific to the cafeterias though, that's one particular area that we know um, can be very challenging for students with sensory, uh, sensory needs. And so one of the things that we've done in this document is we've provided a guidance tool, sort of a planning tool for schools that are looking to create spaces, and one of them could be a, a quiet cafeteria for students to be able to access. So the tool will walk staff through the process of creating that space. Um, so there's information related to the purpose of the space, the physical environment of the space, the aesthetics of the space, um, things like temperature and sound and lighting, um, the instructional materials or other materials that you'll have as part of that space. So all of these things are part of the consideration for access to this particular space. Um, and then of course, there'll be supervision needs that have to be addressed for some of these spaces, especially a space like a, a calming cafeteria. And so once we finalize this document uh, in November at our principal briefing, uh, we did present this document to all of our principals, and we spoke a little bit about the use of the planning tool, and we had an opportunity to have one of the assistant principals at Robinson Secondary School, Carly Zook, present to the principals and speak to Robinson's Quiet Cafe, because they've created very successfully a quiet cafe, a space for students and it's not limited to only students with disabilities. It's really accessible to any student um, who wishes to eat in an alternative lunch area in a quiet space. And so we do have uh, a number of other schools in the county that have quiet lunch spaces. And so Ms. Zook really sort of talked through their process um, they worked with actually a group of students at the school in the design and the development of the space. And so they got feedback and they set up a schedule of supervision from adults in the school. And then they created a process for students to be able to sign up to eat lunch in that particular space. And so it was a good opportunity for other principals to hear from one of their colleagues about how they successfully were able to start a space like this. Um, and so we're encouraging schools, again, to use this process as they think about their own schools. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, we've realized in just the design and construction of schools is that a separate quiet lunch area or cafe area has not been part of our specifications when we do new building construction or even renovations. And so it is one of the considerations that I know we've spoken to uh, some of our friends and facilities. Um, those are larger discussions that will need to be ongoing because there are so many uh, complexities to the specifications in that process and the building process. Um, but I think that, again, as I mentioned, we're, starter, we're starting to embark on this idea of universal design for learning, which includes the physical spaces that we uh, provide to our students within the school building. Um, it's accessibility does not just occur in the classroom, but accessibility has to move outward, uh, not only in the classroom, but throughout the entire school building, the building grounds outside, outside of the school building, lots of different places. And so um, I'm gonna make sure that we have these conversations so that we can have consideration as we move forward with some of our thinking around universal design. And that's also, as I mentioned, part of the enhancement plan for students with disabilities. And so again, it's an area that we want to definitely focus on. Um, you know, ultimately, if right now parents have concerns about the sensory needs of their children, the IEP team is a great place to have some of those discussions because even outside of sensory support needs within a cafeteria, um, we do provide supports within a classroom. So our teachers and paraprofessionals can provide very focused interventions 
uh, making sure that they're monitoring for students' breaks if they're feeling overwhelmed, uh, if they're uh, inattentive in class, if the lighting or the, the temperature is impacting them. There are also lots of environmental supports that we can provide within a school, even in a larger um, cafeteria setting, um, being able to, again, be aware of a student's um, you know, response to temperature and lighting and noise and making sure that we're giving breaks if we need to. And then, of course, there are very specific child-centered focused interventions as we're teaching Absolutely. students new skills to deal with some of their sensory needs. Um, so I, I know we've got limited time, but uh, I just wanted to mention outside of the quiet cafeterias, if a parent has concerns, please let's let's address them through the IP process as well. Absolutely. And we have been advocating on the accessibility of, of grounds and including accessibility in the CIP for a few years now. Um, so if there are uh, conversations happening on that, we would certainly love to join you and collaborate on that with you. Um, Cause that is certainly a need in the renovation process, especially given how long our renovation queue is. Um, buildings that are getting renovated now won't be renovated again for over 45 years, I think, or some, something around there this point. So it's important that we have these conversations now. Um, and I appreciate the work that will hopefully be done. We do have two somewhat related follow-ups to this. Um, one is, are these rooms, the quiet cafeterias, supposed to be in every elementary school? And if the tool or guidance document doesn't require schools to have alternative spaces, it ends up, as we, always, as we constantly discuss, the fidelity implementation, it ends up creating inequitable access across the county from school to school. So is FCPS requiring alternative spaces in schools or is this at principal discretion from building to building? Yeah, right now there is no requirement. It is uh, principal discretion building to building, but we really are trying to um, you know, build the administrator's capacity by providing the guidance document to think about the needs of their students. Uh, one thing I didn't mention is we also shared in January with all of the special education department chairs at their meeting, the guidance tool and the guidance document as well. But uh, but right now there is no requirement that every school um, has a, a quiet cafeteria or a quiet eating space. But many, many schools do provide, you know, opportunities for students to, um, come out of the larger cafeteria. There are still lots of schools that are that are pulling groups of students, general education and special educations together in small group where they're working on social skills development, peer interactions, eating lunch, uh, a good time for building peer relationships. Um, so it's again, it's a different purpose, but it's again, outside of the larger cafeteria. But some of those discussions again, are definitely part of the IEP process. Thank you. Quick update on the UDL training um, question, quick follow-up on that. Are IAs and specialists included in the U UDL training? Um, I will need to find out. I'm not sure about paraprofessionals for that initial April 2nd training. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you with an answer on that. Thank you. Yep. All right. Um, this may be more for Dawn, possibly, or Terry. Um, what course of action should a parent take if their IEP says that daily logs are supposed to go home for IEP and medical needs, but it, it, that's not happening or only a partial report comes home? So first and 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 always, I would contact your, your child's case manager. Um, and if you don't have any, any luck there, I would involve... Um, the administrator in the building who supervises special education. And if you're not sure who that is, the principal. Um, your procedural support liaison can also assist. Um, but those would be the, the first um, two contacts that I would suggest. Um, and your, your PSL, if it's, it's a situation that um, they feel like they're not quite able to, to help make a, a change with, um, they can also involve, um, involve us in the, in our office to, to help with the communication and, and working things out. Sometimes, um, sometimes we use the same words to describe different things. 
Um, and there can be misunderstandings that we don't even know are misunderstandings. So, um, but definitely your case manager is the first person to contact when there's a concern. Thank you, Don. Um, we have a question specifically for Tina Wilkerson that's come in tonight. Um, Tina, what happens if a family is choosing not to use ABA with their autistic child, but the school seems to be completely working only with ABA? Can there even be a dialogue? Um, more broadly, how is FCPS working to adapt current ABA, ABA programming to be more neurodiversity affirming? Many autistic adults speak about the negative impacts of ABA in their lives. So as far as how we're adapting it, we actually have really looked at our programming and it has, because we have so many BCBAs ethically, we are using positive programming as much as possible with the kids. And we are really um, respecting their their characteristics and their, their abilities that they have and working from a strength instead of from their needs. Um, additionally, we are that that would be a conversation that would be had at the IEP as to what strategies. And I would say I wouldn't want to say we're not going to use ABA strategies because a lot of those strategies are used in every classroom. But maybe it's a discussion with the parent about what we think might be used in, as part of the strategies and coming to consensus with them on that. If there if there is difficulty with that conversation in the IEP meeting, who should um, families reach out to to help facilitate that discussion? I definitely would um, have them reach out to the the PSL. They are more than welcome to call me at any time, and we can talk through it and help with that process. But really, your PSL is going to be your best ally in talking through what what the you know the team thinks your child needs, what you think they need, and how to come to consensus on that. Thank you, Tina. Um, if you could put your email in the chat, I'll read it aloud and I'll share it out. Um, that would okay. be great. All right, um, this should be a fairly quick one. Do we have a current dyslexia specialist? Um, has somebody been hired and can families contact them directly? So instructional services um, did hire a new dyslexia specialist. And I know that we did um, receive notice uh, from instructional services I believe it was it was last week. Um, I can I can send you information on the start date because I think there was a, a transition period as this person was moving from their current position into the specialist position, the dyslexia specialist position. I don't know if the uh, if the announcement from instructional services has gone out to the public yet. So let me. I haven't seen anything. Yeah, let me find that out and see. I can again let you know, um, because I do anticipate that they are going to send that announcement out shortly to the public. Great, thank you. We will look forward to that information and we will share it um, as soon as we have it. We may need to connect with you, Mike, to get the email address. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and uh, for those watching the recording, Tina's email, Tina Wilkerson's email for ABA questions is T Wilkerson, T W I L K E R S O N at fcps.edu. Um, a follow up dyslexia question Is there an update with regards to resources for families of kids with dyslexia in Orton Gilling, in the Orton Gillingham program? There's a disconnect where families are not involved and don't know how to help their child. The Orton Gillingham training has really been uh, a training that has been provided by both instructional services and our Office of Special Education Instruction. And so I know that there, there are materials that are part of the Orton Gillingham program, but it's not a structured program similar to some of our specialized reading programs. Um, so it is a little bit different in that respect. I would say that if parents are wanting to be able to reinforce some of the things that their children are learning through the implementation of the Orton-Gillingham methodology with their children, that they should reach out to the school team, especially to that teacher 
who's instructing their child. And that teacher will be able to, I guess, hone in a little bit more specifically on the skills that they're working on with their particular child. Um, I think that would probably be um, probably the quickest way to get an answer around how a parent might best be able to support. Um, I'll reach out to my colleagues in instructional services and uh, as well as Dr. Jugnu Agrawal, our program manager of special education curriculum, um, just to see if there are going to be uh, any resources that they might be able to provide for parents um, who are interested in, again, in just learning more about what's happening with their children and how they can help to support, you know, their children at home as they work through the, uh, the OG methodology in, in school. Um, perhaps this is something once the dyslexia specialist is on board and comfortable, I'm not going to throw them into the fire immediately. Um, but I know our specialists like Kristen Haynor, the neurodiversity specialist, and Nonia Latameji, the um, 2E specialist, do family resource center webinars. Um, perhaps the dyslexia specialist could look into doing an, a family resource center webinar, speaking to how can families support OG methodology at home. Great. Yeah, I'll definitely bring that suggestion to the new dyslexia specialist and to our team. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Yeah, I mean, we trying to be respectful of the fact, like, it, it's always great to check in with your teacher. That should always be the first place to go. And also, we know our teachers are totally overwhelmed and have so much going on. So anything that we can take off their plate um, is good. <laughs> To... Oh, yes, there was my, I knew I had another one that had come in. Um, Denise, this may be mostly your department. It relates to PAC. Can you speak to the efforts to provide rest and nap time in the preschool autism classrooms for the younger kids, the long days need, need to include nap time? That's actually going to be Tina. So I'm going to hand it off to her. Oh, there you go. <laughs> So we we do not have all the kids that laying down, and part of that is that they're, they're that our kids with autism tend to have problems with circadian rhythm, and each parent has their own plan for sleeping for kids. Um, but if a child is getting tired, and you can just see it in their eyes that they need to take a nap, we we recommend a you know a quiet area with a bean bag to place them down there and let them sleep, and then to wake them up when they're ready so that they're there and fresh for learning. Is there, I mean, do classrooms have room to have like, like I know personally, like speaking, of, I know my child will not fall asleep if she can see other people doing things. Um, so is there a way, like I, it's been a long time since we've been in preschool. Is there a way that preschool teachers can block off that visual stimuli so that child can do that? There, so typically our rooms have a lot of bookcases too, you know, and we, we kind of separate our areas so that the kids know what's expected in each area. If they're in a back area, like a play area, it's pretty much blocked off and it's quiet. I know classroom setup is very personal from teacher to teacher. So, you know, perhaps that's just some, you know, quick just sharing of something to consider for the kids mm -hmm. that are in their class if they do have kids that need to sleep. Um, because that can be the visual stimuli lie can be a lot for for kids, and it's very I know it's very hard for me to shut off. Um, we do have a couple of two e questions as well. I'm sure we'll have some other follow ups coming in. So, um, I'm going to switch to two e as a topic for a few minutes. Um. Is FCPS providing required professional development to all FCPS educators and IAs on supporting twice exceptional students? Is the 2E handbook and or other resources being provided to all educators each year? And what is the plan to improve understanding the types of supports a 2E student may need? So I think a couple of those questions are probably uh, better answered by our twice exceptional specialist, Dr. Agreed. O. Yeah. And I do want to give everyone a heads up. There are some two e questions that came in that we will that we're not going to ask tonight because we are in the process of planning a follow up to e event with Dr. Reed, um, similar to what we had last year where it was a hybrid in person um, virtual event and Dr. Reed was in person and families were able to come and ask questions like this. So we have held many of them back and we may take some of 
even the ones I ask here, we may take forward to that meeting as well. So if you did submit a question on it and you don't hear it tonight, that's why. Um, we are not forgetting you. There's just going to be a whole topic on this. Mm -hmm. um, but anything that you can answer to that, Mike, would be great. Sure. Well, I can say that uh, right now there is no requirement for training. And that's always a big question when we've got, um, you know, areas where there is concern around teacher training. And again, part of the inconsistencies across schools is the result of some staff either being trained and others not being trained. And so it is a conversation that's ongoing uh, along with balancing all of the other required trainings that uh, are coming from other departments. But to my knowledge right now, there is no required training for teachers on meeting the needs of twice exceptional learners in their in their classrooms. Thank you. We we do talk about um, twice exceptional needs often in our meetings. And as I said at the beginning, when we do our general membership updates, we do um, bring updates from those meetings to the membership. Um, so know that this is an ongoing discussion um, and will not end tonight. Thank you, Mike. Um, can a middle school schooler be tested for the twice exceptional program or is it only for elementary school kids? My understanding is that as with any other, you know, special education needs, a twice exceptional child can be identified at any time. Can anybody speak more to that? Yeah, I can't speak directly to the uh, the process through the Advanced Academics Program Office. Um, certainly, someone who qualifies um, for Advanced Academics Programming. Um, and then a student who qualifies as a student with a disability um, under that definition would be a twice exceptional learner. So there could be middle school students who, again, they fall under both of those categories and would be considered twice exceptional learners. And we're getting follow-ups and I was going to address this. Um, I do want to clarify that there is not technically a 2E program. There is advanced academic programming as Mike Bloom uh, mentioned. Uh, there is not a specific twice exceptional program. Um, so it's mostly about how are the needs with students with dis for students with disabilities being met within the, ac the advanced academics framework. Yes, and we don't, we don't, there's no, again, qualification process for twice exceptional learners. It's really being able to qualify as a student with a disability and then under our advanced academics program. There are qualifications, though, for the AAP program, there are, correct? Yes, that's right. Yes. That's right. Can you share a little bit as to what those are? I really don't want to speak to that since it's not okay. my program. So I just don't want to misspeak. But we can certainly, you, yeah, we can certainly get you that information. The other thing that I'll mention is our twice exceptional specialist will be attending the ACSD meeting on February 21st. And so that's going to be coming up shortly. So if you're interested, um, you can certainly, uh, we'll have the recording of that available on the ACSD website, or you can come in person. Uh, that meeting begins at 7 p.m. on February 21st, Wednesday evening, and uh, Dr. O will be there, and she'll be available to uh, answer questions of committee members and just provide a little bit more information on the work that she's been doing in Fairfax County. Fantastic. And as we said, we are looking at a March 2E program as well, and Dr. O would be invited to that also. Um, so we will be holding on to these questions for that to keep an eye out. We're trying to work out Dr. Reed's attendance at this time. So as soon as we have a date that's available for Dr. Reed, we will get that information out to everyone. This final question is not, it, it does relate to twice exceptional. It's not specifically something that I think Dr. O would be able to answer to. Um, it's more, it, it, it's more central office decision. It's a question about will there ever be, like, is there a plan? Will there be an FCPS twice exceptional center slash academy, like a separate program because we don't have one? Is there any discussion of consideration for creating one? 
I know that when Dr. Boyd was assistant superintendent, this question had also come up um, to her. And I believe there may have even been some advocacy uh, with Dr. Reed. I there believe. was, and she expressed yeah. interest in pursuing it. I'm not sure if there's been any progress. Yeah, so I'm not that. aware personally of any any progress around that question. Um, Dr. Edmonds heard, I don't know if you've heard anything related to Thanks, that. Thanks, Mike. Uh, no, I can't say that I have. I haven't heard anything or in regards to that. All right. Um, we will make sure, as I said, we will make sure to send these questions um, to the relevant people ahead of our twice exceptional event so they are prepared to answer them. Um, just to be clear for everyone here tonight, while we did share topics with DSS that would likely be covered tonight, we did not share the specific questions. So we appreciate that they are answering a lot of this on the fly, um, of course, with the ones coming in during the chat also. Um, so thank you. We appreciate your candor tonight. Um, I have heard there is a question coming in. Are there any updates regarding Medicaid services in FCPS? Can somebody speak a little bit about that for anybody who might not be aware of it and share any updates? I think we might need a little more clarification on that question um, regarding Medicaid services. I think FCPS uh, and, and school divisions in general tend to bill uh, Medicaid um, for uh, the billable services that we provide to students who are eligible for Medicaid. Um, but I, I, I'm not sure what, um, not sure what that question is, is asking in terms of services. I'm a little unclear as well. I have something rattling in the back of my brain that there's been some talk of things regarding the, the payments that you were talking about, the billing. <laughs> Um, but I cannot remember what they are right now. So for the person who posted that, if you can provide any clarity, I would certainly appreciate it. Um, I know there is some, there has been some talk around expanding what can be billed um, for Medicaid services. Um, and I don't know if that has gotten off the ground yet. Um, I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of hands in that pot to get that off the ground. And so um, we rely on uh, Tamara Gibson, who's our Medicaid manager, to to be our um, to be our conduit to those other entities that are involved. So um, she has alerted us that this is conversation that's happening, but um, not that it's that it's gotten off the ground in FCPS yet. Okay, I do have clarity coming in from that person. Is there a process change for consent to access Medicaid services? Is there a handbook regarding Medicaid services for parents? Ah, thank you. Um, I know that the state um, has been working with the school division Medicaid managers um, around that. We were waiting for some additional direction before we updated our processes, um, but I'll certainly follow up with um, Tamara around that and get an update from her. It may be that um, with lots of other things going on, we just haven't connected on that. And I apologize, I missed the second part of the question. Is there any kind of handbook regarding Medicaid services for parents as it relates, of course, to the school? Not. I will ask Tamara that question too. And I, I don't know if anybody else knows, but um, I, I certainly don't, but I'll ask her. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, and we will share if we get updates on that, we will certainly share that. Um, there was a follow there was a question entered in the chat about the data breach that we all got notified about in December. What are some steps that DSS is taking to prevent sensitive information about our children from being accidentally given to others? And this is in full disclosure, this is not just DSS, this is FCPS as a whole. It, it, and D, D, does DSS have any updates? Because this, I know that this does overall, the IT part does lie outside of DSS. But do you guys have any information specific to the data breach? I'll, I'll weigh in just a little bit. We don't have any additional or new updates um, that we can necessarily provide that weren't provided already like in December. 
um, at, you know, as it was handled, that information went out from division council and from Dr. Reed's office, of course, and was done in conjunction with the FOIA and FERPA office. Um, and it's still being handled by them. And of course, there's an email box that if you have questions and concerns, um, that can be sent to them too as well. So I know they are working on um, that the FOIA and the FERPA office um, being a part of division council too as well. So we haven't gotten any any other updates since then regarding that. I don't know if anybody else has anything that they've possibly heard. Um, I will share that um, there is some division-wide training regarding uh, FOIA and FERPA and the confidentiality of student records that is um, going to be launched uh, fairly shortly. Um, and it's a, it's a more in-depth um, division-wide training for anyone who, who accesses student records. Um, and I, I don't have an exact launch date, but I can certainly check on that. So if it's anybody that accesses student records, would this include registrars at the schools? I believe so. It's a it's a comprehensive division wide training. Yes. Thank you. Um, can somebody put the email um, box for the data breach into chat so that I can share out? Um, and I believe I just want to follow up. This was from an FCCPTA um, membership, an FCCPTA meeting in December. Um, I believe, and would like clarification slash confirmation. Um, that Dr. Reed said that people could email that address and share a, a specific ask that there's something on the form that there were multiple versions of the form that got sent out. And there's something on the form that identifies which version you got. And if you talk with the email address, with the people on the other end of the email address, they can share with you a more comprehensive idea of what exact data um, was accessed for your student. Is that Am I correctly remembering that? Do you have any information on that? I don't, I'm sorry. Maybe, I don't know if Terry does. It does sound familiar, Amanda. I'd have to really, like you were saying, kind of rattle my brain to remember exactly because it's been a while and we haven't heard anything. And actually I'm looking for the email box. I'll see if I can stick that in the chat. But I do feel that it was depending on what type of letter you received um, they could tell you what information was shared. So that does sound very familiar. Let me see if I can find the email um, address so I can stick it in the chat as well. Thank you. Um, and I do believe that FCCPTA recorded that and shared the meeting on Facebook. Um, so if anybody is, um, and Dr. Reed comes for the first like maybe 15 to 30 minutes of the meeting. So you don't have to you know, scroll into timestamps or anything. Um, if you're interested to see that Q&A, there was a Q&A on it. I, unfortunately, my long-term memory is not that detailed. So I don't remember exactly what was asked and exactly what the answers were, but that um, resource is available for you if you have not yet seen it. Just go to FCCPTA, search um, F is in Frank, CCPTA, Fairfax County Council PTA on Facebook, and it should be on their public page. All right, um, we are beginning to wrap up. Um, I do have a question, one final question um, that relates. Um, are parents going to receive access to a child's CSTARS account? School G is accessible, but CSTARS is not. No, not at this time. Uh, parents have access to anything that is. Um, produced. CSTARS is not the record. Um, and we can certainly, um, if it's requested, we can certainly sit with a parent and go through their child's, C you know, page and CSTARS, their record. Um, but the most recent IEP um, for students is certainly in um, parent view in CIS. Yeah. So you can access that anytime. I was going to follow up with that that I believe is new this year, correct? Um, uh, definitely this year. It may have launched um, in the spring um, as well. But yes, it's it's there. Um, Are, it's very useful. Am I remembering correctly that quarterly progress reports for the IEP should also be available in Parent View? 
I think it, I think you are correct. I should know the answer to this because I have my, <laughs> my own. I think you are correct, Amanda. <laughs> I got a, I got a confirmation. Yes. From a, a teacher in the, the chat. So thank you. Awesome. <laughs> thank you for the confirmation. Um, it is 850. Um, we have spent a lot of time talking about these. Um, we do have some questions that um, we haven't had a chance to cover, but I do want to follow up with the final question and um, give any of you an opportunity to answer it. Um, so if your question was not asked tonight, we will um, go through these and send a follow up document to Terry and Mike um, and share as we are able. Um, and again, those two e-questions will not be part of that. We will save those two e-questions for the 2E event in March. Um, but as our final question, and this is open to our entire FCPS panel here tonight. Ooh, uh, thank you, Dr. Edmund Sird. Um, the data breach email is privacy at fcps.edu. So if you have further, if you, further questions about your specific um, child related to the data breach, privacy at fcps.edu is where you need to send them. I will put that in the chat for everyone. Um, so for the final question of the evening, open to everyone. Um, what is something that you had hoped to communicate to families tonight that we might not have covered in the questions asked? Well, they definitely asked a lot of great questions. <laughs> we have they a covered, wonderfully informed they, membership. They definitely covered the gamut of things. Um, I, one of the things that I wish that I had mentioned at the beginning was just more, and Mike did pick it up about our enhancement plan and all of the work that we have going on um, with the plan, just so that they know we've been very active in implementing the recommendations that were made by AIR. Um, we have four areas of goals that were set up from those recommendations around um, communication and community engagement, instruction and inclusive practices, um, special education processes, and staff capacity. We have a governance team that meets um, twice a week where we discuss different issues that are going on with the implementation plan. And not just in, um, issues, but also celebrations, because we have our team has been working extremely hard to get the plan developed, to get it shared with different groups, uh, such as um, in fall, in the fall, we just had that parent and administrator group that came and met with us and received feedback. Most recently, we just met with the RAS or our regional assistant of superintendents and executive principal group to share it with them. Um, so we really have things up and running. Our implementation teams have two co-chairs each, and they are constantly championing the plan. Um, so we are very proud of the work that we've been doing around that, and we're excited about continuing our work around our enhancement plan. Thank you, Dr. Minster. There was a lot of work that went into that last year. Um, Lauren McCaughey, our vice president, was our representative on that committee last year. Many hours went into those discussions. Um, additionally, I also want to inform our members who are left, there has been uh, convened a follow-up committee from the core planning team from the strategic plan that I and Michelle Cades were a part of. She's our advocacy co-chair. Um, we were a part of on behalf of SEPTA last year. We received an invite. Um, we have responded. I have not heard back confirmation yet, but we are hoping to be able to participate in those four meetings that are happening between now and the end of the year as well. And we will certainly, as long as that confirmation went through, um, we will certainly update our members on that moving forward. Do any of our other FCPS uh, panel members have anything to share? I just wanted to share uh... First of all, my my thanks and gratitude for SEPTA and for your organization. Just being a part of our conversations that we have year to year, in my position, I've seen the positive impact that your advocacy and your partnering around very important topics and areas that impact our students with disabilities in Fairfax County has paid some great dividends. And especially as we move into some challenging times with the upcoming budget, um, it really weighs heavily on my mind, teacher burnout and retention and recruitment. And so, again, I know you mentioned it here this evening, but uh, as much advocacy as we can have and support from SEPTA, from our educators and our 
our families out there related to the importance of being able to provide that additional um, you know, care for our special educators so that we can keep and recruit uh, the best and the very best for our children, I think that would be would be much appreciated. So I just wanted to mention that here tonight. Um, and thank you again just for your your great support and collaboration with us. Thank you, Mike. Um, we do we do want to support our educators as much as possible. For the educators who are in the room tonight, you are our child's primary contact with school. You mean a lot to our kids, you mean a lot to us, and we are here to do whatever we can to help support you. Um, so please know that, please reach out to us. Amy LaCrosse is our fantastic uh, teacher, educator chair. Um, please reach out to her at any time. Um, she is incredibly knowledgeable and helpful in our advocacy on behalf of teachers. Um, her SEPTA email is teacherliaison at fairfaxcountysepta.org. Um, so please connect with her. And also for budget purposes, please keep an eye on our social media. Um, we, we will, if we are able, put out a, um, a budget call to action as soon as we know when the um, dates for the public hearing are um, and as soon as we know more details. Um, as Mike said, the, the superintendent's budget is being released at the school board meeting um, this Thursday. So you can take a look. Um, online at Board Docs. If you don't know what Board Docs is, um, search Fairfax County Schools and Board Docs. And that's where all of the school board documentation goes. It's kind of overwhelming. So if you need a little help, feel free to send me an email and I'll do my best to help you because um, it's a little convoluted, quite frankly, but at least it's all in one place. Um, so as soon as we have any further dates, we will share that information. The more voices as happened with the preschool initiative, the more voices that we have speaking to this, the more effective the advocacy work is. So we really encourage all of our members to participate with us. If you would like to speak as, you know, and identify yourself as a SEPTA member, one, you need to be a paid member. So hit up fcsepta.ptboard.com and come on and join us. Um, and two, our advocacy co-chairs, Diane Cooper-Gold and Michelle Cades, can help you um, with crafting language that goes along with our advocacy positions. So um, their email is advocacy at fairfaxcountysepta.org. So please feel free to reach out. Um, we want all of you to be engaged. We wanna help uplift the voices of our families, our students, our teachers. That is our mission. That is what we're here for. Um, and we are so excited to help celebrate our teachers as well. One more save the date before I let everybody go. Everybody in this room, please save the date for Saturday, May 11th. Um, it's either going to be a 6.30 or 7 o'clock start. I don't have the specific time yet. That is the date of our annual award ceremony where, where we will recognize teachers from across FCPS for their work in um, supporting students with disabilities. Um, that application we are hoping to launch on February 15th, and it'll be open for a month. You do not need to be a SEPTA member to nominate anyone. Your nominee does not need to be a SEPTA member. Of course, we always encourage it, but there are no barriers. We just encourage you to spread the love and share the amazing work that teachers are doing in our schools so we can give them the recognition that they deserve. Um, we had about, I believe, Lauren, correct me if I'm wrong, because I was in the hospital with my child that weekend last year, so I didn't see it, but I believe there were about 300 people in person. Um, it's a very big celebratory event. It is fantastic. Thank you. Um, and for teachers who are present, our winter mini grants program is currently open. Head to our website at fairfaxcountysepta.org and click on teachers and you can get to the application. You do need to be a SEPTA member in order to apply for an application. It is only $6 for teachers. So we, we want you, please come join and ask us for money because we want to give it to you. <laughs> Thank you everybody for a wonderful night. With all of that said, we will head off for the evening and enjoy your night. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to our FCPS panel, appreciate you.